y'all. So tonight we're going to be starting chapter six, and the title of that is Finding One's Pack, Belonging is Blessing. So um, I did not remember this one at all from the years ago when I read this book. So um, I just, like I said, I only read through the section that I'm going to share with you ahead of time, and it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be really good. And so far to me, the book kind of seems like it's building. Um, each part, each chapter that we read is building on the last one. <clears throat> and, um, and regardless, it's, it's all, um, it all works together. All of this information is, um, closely, um, interwoven with regard to how important it is in our lives, in our transformation, in our healing, um, as we exit uh, narcissistic um, experiences with with people. So um, I hope that you get some uh, good things to think about out of this one. And um, you know, it was kind of hard for me to um, to wrap up chapter five, and I. I I actually realized I didn't tell you all <laughs> that that was the last video in chapter five. And I feel like, I feel like it needs its own, um, additional like wrap up video <laughs> for some reason. It was just such a, uh, a rich chapter, you know, um, discussing skeleton woman and uh, so many lessons and so much that we can pull from that and so many different directions we can take it. It was just hard. It was hard for me to, to wrap that up. <laughs> and I had a few ideas on a wrap up video and who knows, I might actually come back out with that at some point. But, um, but for now, I think we, we can go ahead and move on to chapter six. And, um, so let's dive in. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Again, chapter six, it's called Finding One's Pack, Belonging is Blessing. And I'm still a little bit <clears throat> raspy with my voice and I have um, um, a little bit of um, respiratory issues, but um, hopefully I can make it through this one without stopping and, and coughing and getting cough drops. And um, I just hope that it comes out smooth. That's, that's my intention. The day has gone pretty well so far for me today, so fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, so... It says, The Ugly Duckling. Sometimes life goes wrong for the wildish woman from the beginning. Many women had parents who surveyed them as children and puzzled over how the small alien had managed to infiltrate the family. Other parents were always looking heavenward, ignoring or abusing the child or giving her the old icicle eye. Let women who have had this experience take heart. You have avenged yourself by having been, through no fault of your own, a handful to raise and an eternal thorn in their sides. And let me just go ahead and say, I, I, so far, based on everything I've read in this chapter, this can totally apply to men as well. So if you're, if you're watching this and, and you're a man, then I think that you can take this just every time you hear a woman. I think there's nothing special with regard to women that I have found so far in this story that I remember. <laughs> um, let women or men who have had this experience take heart. You have avenged yourself by having been through no fault of your own, a handful to raise and an eternal thorn in their sides. And perhaps even today you were able to inspire them to object fear when you come a knocking. That's not too shabby as innocent re retribution goes. See to it now that you spend less time on what they didn't give you and more time on finding the people you belong to. You may not belong to your original family at all. <clears throat> you may match your family genetically, but temperamentally you may belong to another group of people. Or you may belong to your family perfunc perfunctorily. <laughs> I'll pop that word up on the screen. I don't know. While your soul leaps out, runs down the road... <laughs> And is gluttonously happy, munching spiritual cookies somewhere else. <laughs> She's so creative. <laughs> um, Hans Christian Andersen, or Hans Christian Andersen, wrote dozens of stories about the orphan archetype. He was a premier advocate of the lost and neglected child, and he strongly supported searching for and finding one's own kind. <clears throat> And then she goes into the um, the story of the Ugly Duckling. Uh, it says, first published in 1845, so it's been around a while. It says, for the last two centuries, <clears throat> the Ugly Duckling has been one of the few stories to encourage successive generations of outsiders to hold on till they find their own. 
it is a psychological and spiritual root story. Spiritual root story. A root story is one that contains a truth so fundamental to human development that without integration of this fact, further progression is shaky. And one cannot entirely prosper psychologically until this point is realized. So, <clears throat> you know, in Skeleton Woman, in the last chapter, you know, it was about coming face to face with areas within ourselves and within our relationships that need to be addressed, um, issues, you know, um, wounds, problems, challenges, however you want to spin it. And so I love, like I was talking about how, how all this seems to build. So I feel like this chapter, <clears throat> what I've read so far is going to really help us understand, um, you know, how we can examine once these issues pop up, once we become aware of them, because Skeleton Woman is about the shock of becoming aware, you know, like that initial stage, becoming aware. And then now this chapter is going to be assessing, you know what I mean, looking a little bit closer, deeper. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to summarize the story of the Ugly Duckling, and she says that, um, that what she puts in the book here is actually a translation. And so um, I'm sure there's a lot of different versions of it. But basically, it <clears throat> it's very kind of, you know, fairy tale like in the way it's descriptive with all the details. And, um, and so it just talks about this, um, this duck that, you know, she's brooding on her nest of eggs <clears throat> and everything's going fine and then one day they all hatch except this one egg and this one egg is like different it's it's bigger than all the others and uh, she's hopeful you know so like um there's other ducks that come by and you know remember it's a fairy tale so they're like talking to the you know the mother duck and they're saying you know well when do you think that one's gonna hatch and sure does look different than all the others you think something's wrong with it and she's like no 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 she's you know she's a very hopeful mom she's looking on the bright side of things and um eventually it it, it um hatches the duck hatches <clears throat> and he and it describes him <laughs> it says uh it finally broke open, and out tumbled a big, ungainly creature. His skin was etched with curly red and blue veins. His feet were pale purple. His eyes transparent pink. And so, <laughs> it says the mother cocked her head and stretched her neck and peered at him. She couldn't help herself. She pronounced him ugly. So, <clears throat> so this this sets his destiny for a, a, a little while, right? So he, um, he struggles, you know, as he's growing up, he is different. He's, um, <clears throat> it's obvious to everybody, to him, to everybody else that he's, he's very different. So it just goes into all the challenges that he faces. And, um, if you have ever felt like you're different or like, you know, you're, you're not like the rest of your family, then you can relate to this story. And, um, it's, it's enjoyable to read, honestly. <clears throat> so then it says, um, you know, finally, after going through all of these horrible experiences and being bullied and being ignored and rejected and all this, it says, he came upon a pond, and as he swam there, it became colder and colder. A flock of creatures flew overhead, the most beautiful he had ever seen. They cried down to him, and hearing their sounds made his heart leap and break at the same time. He cried back in a sound he had never heard before made. He had never seen creatures more beautiful, and he had never felt more bereft. He turned and turned in the water to watch them till they flew out of sight. Then he dove to the bottom of the lake and huddled there, trembling. He was beside himself, for he felt a desperate love for those great white birds, a love he could not understand. <clears throat> so it's almost like, you know, that was the first time that he had ever seen those kind of birds but there was just this almost like an innate instinctual knowing um, a desire a um, a connection and he felt this connection but he didn't understand it and um, I just thought that was beautiful the way she describes this because um, <clears throat> I think that we can relate to this um, you know 
uh, finding our own kind. And um, prior to that, not even knowing if they really exist. And so um, it just, you know, so that was a glimpse. That was a glimpse. But then they, they went on. They flew on. So he's um, it, he still has more challenges he goes through and all this, right? <clears throat> and then finally it says, um, well, he, he wound up on this farm. And, you know, it says the farmer's wife chased him with her broom and the children screamed with laughter. And, you know, he's still enduring all this stuff, right? And it says the duckling flapped through the cat's door and outside at last lay in the snow half dead. From there he struggled on till he came to another pond, then another house, another pond, another house. And the entire winter was spent this way, alternating between life and death. And even so, the gentle breath of spring came again. And the old women shook out the feather beds, and the old men put away their long underwear. New babies came in the night, while fathers paced the yard under starry skies. I want to give you guys like a little taste of the story, the way she writes. During daylight, the young girls put daffodils in their hair, and young men studied girls' ankles. Yeah, right. <laughs> and on a pond nearby, the water became warmer, and the ugly duckling who floated there stretched his wings. How strong and big his wings were. They lifted him high over the land. From the air he saw the orchards in their white gowns, the farmers plowing, the young of all of nature hatching, tumbling, buzzing and swimming. Also, paddling on the pine were <clears throat> three swans, the same beautiful creatures he had seen the autumn before, those that so caused his heart to ache. He, pull, he felt pulled to join them. So there they are again. What if they act as though they like me? And then I just, and then just as I join them, they fly away laughing. So see, this is what he's used to. So he's expecting this, which is our struggle. If we have, you know, we, if we were raised in a negative, um, bullying type narcissistic environment you know we may have that that uh, victim mindset for a while which is you know can make us even look narcissistic ourselves things like this so our conditioning can work against us so he's already you know expecting the worst <clears throat> it says but he glided down and landed on the pond his heart beating hard as soon as they saw him the swans began to swim toward him no doubt I'm about to meet my end thought the duckling. But if I'm to be killed, then rather by these beautiful creatures than by hunters, farm wives, or long winters. And he bowed his head to await the blows. It says, but la, I'm thinking I've never heard that. I've always heard low. But la, in the reflection of the water, he saw a swan in full dress. A swan in full dress. Snowy plumage, slow eyes, and all. The ugly duckling did not at first recognize himself. This is in the reflection in the water, right? For he looked just like the beautiful strangers, just like those he had admired from afar. And it turned out that he was one of them after all. His egg had accidentally rolled into a family of ducks. He was a swan, a glorious swan. And for the first time, his own kind came near him and touched him gently and lovingly with their wingtips. They groomed him with their beaks and swam round and round him in greeting. And then it talks about, you know, it wraps up the story, you know, with the normal happenings of spring and children and, you know, <clears throat> all this stuff. I thought that was really beautiful. So um, <clears throat> then it gets into the symbolism of this. So let's, let's keep going. It says, the problem of the exiled one is primeval. Many fairy tales and myths center around the theme of the outcast. In such tales, the central figure is tortured by events outside her venue, often due to a poignant oversight. In The Sleeping Beauty, the 13th fairy is overlooked and not invited to the christening, which results in a curse being placed upon the child, effectively exiling everyone in one way or another. Sometimes the exile is enforced through sheer meanness, as when the stepmother casts her stepdaughter out into the dark wood in Vasilisa the Wise. Remember the story of Vasilisa a few chapters back? <clears throat> if you don't, there's a video on it. Other times, exile comes about as a result of a naive error. And then it talks about, like, 
um, and it goes into details. And then sometimes exile comes from striking a bargain one does not understand. And that that reminds me of when you, um, you're you fooled by a manipulator, a narcissist. And so you're, you're you know, like if you, if you marry one or if you um, <clears throat> get fooled into, you know, a business partnership with one or a friendship with one, it's, it's a bargain that you, you don't understand. And so um, that can exile you. Okay, so hold on to that thought. You're thinking, how would that exile me? What does that mean? It says, the ugly duckling has many versions, all of which contain the same nucleus of meaning. The core meanings we are concerned with are these. The duckling of the story is symbolic of the wild nature, which, when pressed into circumstances of little nurture, instinctively strives to continue no matter what. The wild nature instinctively holds on and holds out. Sometimes with style, other times with little grace, but holds on nonetheless, <clears throat> or nevertheless. And thank goodness for that. For the wildish woman, duration is one of her greatest strengths. So it's like our spirit, you know. It feels like it's almost snuffed out when you're entangled with a narcissist, but there's still a little, a little spark there. Hanging on, you know. The other important <clears throat> aspect of the story is that when an ind individual's particular kind of soulfulness, <clears throat> excuse me, which is both an instinctual and a spiritual identity, is surrounded by psychic acknowledgement and acceptance, that person feels life and power as never before. Ascertaining one's own psychic family brings a person vitality and belongingness. So, um, so the exile is in here. It's, um, when you strike that bargain, you, you don't understand you're striking that bargain with a narcissist. You're being fooled. Okay. And that's the, their point. That's their game. And what's happening is you're, you're now exiled from yourself, from your gut, from your intuition, from your inner guiding light, from, you know, in some regards, from um, that spiritual connection with God, because God speaks to us through our intuition, you know, when you're a spiritual person. So um, you're cut off from all that because a narcissist wants to be in, in control of you and your life. So it's like you're denying yourself. <clears throat> and someone said that to me a while back, that it's, it's really denying yourself and you know sometimes it helps to have someone reframe these concepts and different words and terms and phrases and even though it can kind of mean the same thing as you know if it's put a different way sometimes if it's if it's framed just a certain way then it can really resonate on a deeper level with us like it can click on a deeper level and it can actually open up more awareness for us and therefore more healing for us so um, I like to position things differently <clears throat> and compare and I think that just helps build um, our awareness as we go through um, this healing journey so it says the next section is called exile of the unmatched child <clears throat> unmatched child I'm still having some issues here <clears throat> from getting over my cold. In the story, the various creatures of the village peer at the ugly duckling and one way or another pronounce him unacceptable. He is not ugly in reality, but he does not match the others. He is so different that he looks like a black bean and a bushel of green peas. The mother duck at first tries to defend this duckling, whom she believes to be her offspring, but finally she is profoundly divided emotionally and withdraws from caring for the alien child. His siblings and others of the community fly at him, peck at him, torment him. They mean to chase him away, and the ugly duckling is heartbroken, really, to be rejected by his own. And if you've ever experienced this, it is heartbreaking. It is a terrible thing especially since he really did nothing to warrant it other than look different and act a little different. If truth be told, we have here, before the creature is even half grown, a duckling with a massive psychological complex. <clears throat> and then she goes into um, some more details with this. And um, 
and then she goes into well she goes into like your family and your culture and you know how this uh, uh, translates over from the story into you know um, you know a young girl or boy and it says in the parents fantasy whatever child they will have I'm sorry whatever child they have will be perfect remember this is in the parents fantasy and will reflect only the parents ways and means and I'm going to interject right here right there at that it says or will um, accommodate the conditioning so you know it's not only that you know these parents who are toxic it's not only that they may want the child to be just like them but that they may just want the child to be willing to be the scapegoat to be submissive to be a doormat to be um, accepting of, of abuse and, and you know as children a lot of times children don't even know it's abuse they don't know anything any different because they grew up in that environment they grew up in that home and even though they have these horrible feelings and they may see that others are treated differently it's still not registering you know what I mean because they're just not mentally mature enough to grasp what's really going on <clears throat> if the child is wildish she may unfortunately be subjected to her parents attempts at psychic surgery over and over again for they are trying to remake the child and more so trying to change what her soul requires of her this these are like the families who um it's like a little a little mob and um they are pressuring a child to be a certain way and to go against their instincts, which is tragic. <clears throat> Though her soul requires seeing, now listen to this. Though her soul requires seeing, the culture around her requires sightlessness. In other words, the family is, or even, you know, the extended family or, or even the culture in the area where the child is it says require sightlessness in other words they want the child to deny what they're seeing it's like gaslighting it's like deny like the child may be starting to question like hang on a second this doesn't feel ethical or hang on you know this this is hurtful to me or hey that that's not right why would you do that that's unethical or mean or cruel or whatever but you know the toxic family or environment or workplace or um, spouse or whatever it is they don't want you to um, to see like in the sentence though her soul requires seeing the culture around her requires sightlessness they want you to turn off your own perceptions to basically tolerate and allow evil that's that's what it requires that's what they want okay it says um though her soul wishes to speak its truth she is pressured to be silent neither the child's soul nor her psyche can accommodate this and this is where we have that resistance within ourselves that um i think the term here um, that would relate would be cognitive dissonance where you know you know what's going on you know what you're experiencing is wrong but you're being told it's not wrong you're being gaslit and you, you're struggling like who do you believe like I love these people or this person but I know what I know what I know and so there's this internal struggle <clears throat> Neither the child's soul nor her psyche can accommodate this. Pressure to be adequate in whatever manner authority defines it can chase the child away or underground or set her to wander for a long time looking for a place of nourishment and peace. So when it says um, this pressure that's put on this child, it says can chase the child away. So this can mean, this can translate in a lot of different ways. This is where we can really start to break this down and start to understand how things happen. So what can happen is, you know, um, children may, once, once they have access to, they may, um, <clears throat> start to engage in some kind of escapism via, you know, drugs and alcohol, um, or, you know, there's so many different ways that people engage in, I guess it's called escapism, but you see my point, um, where they're escaping reality because reality is too painful. 
And so um, it says chase the child away or underground. Underground would mean probably wanting to be invisible. Um, just wanting to, um, you know, hide in your shell. Just not be seen because you're shamed. Um, and I'm just trying to break this down and, and, you know, understand how this can apply to us, right? Or set her to wander for a long time looking for a place of nourishment and peace. To me, my note here says makes us vulnerable. So if you're, it's kind of like you're, you know, you're searching. You're searching for, well, I'm not getting nourishment and peace in my own home with my family. So, you know, that's almost like a, um, what's it called? Is it, is it Maslow's hierarchy of needs or something like the triangle? Um, I think that safety is probably like at the baseline. I haven't looked at this in a while. I'm sure that Google can, can <laughs> bring it up for us really quick. But, um, but to me, you know, if you're not even getting those basic things at home, like safety and peace and nourishment, and that can mean, um, <clears throat> physical nourishment, spiritual nourishment, emotional nourishment, you know, all those things. Um, it, it's like she said up here. Um, if truth be told, we have here before the creature is even half grown, a duckling with a massive psychological complex. I mean, yeah. Um, so I think sometimes as we're, you know, um, exiting a narcissistic environment, which that's the lens we're using for this book, right? As we go through, um, you know, things start coming up. We, we, in our, in our desire to never go through something like this again, we want to take a hard look at ourselves and to make sure that we're um, increasing our discernment as much as possible. And by doing that, we're figuring out like, you know, how can I change? What can I change in here that, um, that maybe made me more vulnerable or more tolerant of this um, narcissistic treatment? abuse whatever it is and so um if a if a person grows up literally as a child never even getting validation which is a normal need for a child um i mean an adult should be able to validate themselves right if they're healthy but like a child they they have to have all this stuff from the get-go in order to um to develop that healthy independent processing as an adult and so and that's actually what what the next section's about and is the uh, internal mother so I'm going to wrap this up and then in the next video we'll talk about that internal mother because it's really really interesting I've already read through that because I thought that <laughs> timing wise we could get through that in this first video but um I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up and I just thank you guys for coming along with me and I really hope that you got something out of this and um I don't think I'll have uh, time to put another video out before Sunday. So um, if you're watching this in real time, then Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to you. And uh, I just hope it's um, a really good holiday for you. And then I should have another video out for you on Monday. So thank you guys again. And I hope you have a wonderful night, day, afternoon, whatever it is. And I'll see you soon.